The first thing that we need to do now that we see here the major classification scheme for lipids is go through this diagram and see the foundations. Look at what foundations we need to study before going to the specifics. Now, when we think of it, isn't it that the first question we asked was this? Is my lipid fatty acid containing? And if I have the answer yes, we have a bunch of many words here, but why don't we learn more about our fatty acids, right? The only thing that we have so far in this uh, screen is that fatty acids can be either saturated or unsaturated. Now, we need to know more than that. But before going forward, let's answer the question. What does the word saturated even mean again? Or what does unsaturated mean again? First, when you say saturated, it means that all the carbon-carbon bonds in my structure are single as if you're looking at an alkane. If we have the word unsaturated, I have still, you know, um, a bunch of carbons, but at least one double bond should be present. Now, that, that means regardless of how many carbon-carbon single bonds are present, just the presence of one. Could be two, could be three, could be even five, but just one double bond, and you already call that unsaturated. And needless to say, as you see this screen right here, there are a lot of differences between saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. So again, let's start with the saturated ones. It's quite shorter. There are only carbon-carbon single bonds. And of course, being a fatty acid, somewhere in the structure, uh, you don't see it here, but somewhere in their structures, there's supposed to be a COOH. And the fact that single-single, I mean, carbon-carbon single bonds in organic chemistry are flexible means that it's very easy for these molecules to stack well on top of one another. That would translate to a lot of intermolecular force, particularly London dispersion forces, would make them compact and would make it harder for them to be separated. In other words, it would actually have a higher melting point. It's not really super high that amazingly high levels of heat would not be able to melt it, but it would be enough such that at room temperature, you're going to see this fats or lipids as solids. Margarine is an excellent example. Lard is another example. Butter is somewhat there, although we do know that at hotter room temperatures, uh, it starts to melt, but somewhat still rich in saturated fatty acids. Now, uh, this is just a side note because this is, uh, this is a lot of talk if we want to expound on it. There are studies that show saturated fats are unhealthy, but there are also studies that show that they are not, but let's not go too much into that issue. All we need to see here are examples of the common saturated fatty acids, and they actually have their trivial names. I did mention that the starting number for fatty acids is six carbons, and there, that's where I started here. And you would notice that the more, more popular saturated fatty acids go up in increments of two, making them as if they are all even numbers which is the case here, going all the way to 20. Now, I'm not saying that 20 is the limit. There's actually a name for 22 carbon fatty acid, 24, but I think this is uh, good for the meantime. So I'm leaving the names here, but hopefully you, you, some of them you, you can see are quite popular, like lauric acid, um, coconut oil is linked a lot to that, palmitic acid in palm oil, and actually animals produce a lot of palmitic acid. And uh, maybe some of them you've also heard before. So these are the saturated fatty acids. For the unsaturated fatty acids, of course, they have at least one carbon-carbon double bond. And that double bond is cis. Remember, double bonds can either be cis or trans. And cis means that if I have a carbon-carbon double bond, my two hydrogens are facing either both up or both down, and then the two carbons are facing both up or both down which makes some kind of shape like this, which is what you actually see here. Now, the result of that is, once I have, let's say, a carbon length here, and then I have a cis double bond, uh, take note that the angles are not perfect here, but somewhere along the road, this supposedly straight line bends after the double bond, and probably after another double bond would bend even further. The technical word that we actually find in scientific literature, literature is kink, and that kink would actually uh, place our fatty acids at this certain position that it's as if this kink sets a distance from one fatty acid molecule 
to another. So you can see a while ago, from one fatty acid to another, there's no distance. They're basically sticking to each other. But because of the double bonds in an unsaturated fatty acid, you can see that there's quite a significant distance here. Now, since there's distance here that's produced by the kinks, the intermolecular forces go down. They're not as compact anymore. It's easier to break them apart and... In the naked eye, that would result to us seeing our unsaturated fats as liquid at room temperature. Their melting point is so low that at room temperature, they have already melted. Okay, And unsaturated fatty acids have special notations, which we cannot find in the saturated fatty acids. There are two. We have the delta notation and the omega notation. Here, I'm actually going to ask for your participation. You have to pause if you want to do so. So here, first, I will give an example with the uh, notations given. The structure here that you're seeing is the structure of a so-called palmitoleic acid. Of course, it's unsaturated because of the double bond. Also take note that this carbon is carbon number one, the COOH carbon. And the one opposite the COOH is what we can call the omega carbon, which makes sense because in the Greek alphabet, omega means last, you know. And the delta notation is this, 16 colon 1 delta 9. And its omega notation is actually just a number, is omega 7. So if you want to try this, maybe you want to figure out where we got these numbers for the delta or we, where we got the omega number. But if you're not going to pause, I'm going to explain already. For example, the delta notation has three numbers, 16, 1, and delta 9. The first number refers to the number of carbons. So if you count the number of carbons here, it would be 16. Let's try. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 1, this is quite easy, it refers to the number of double bonds. So there's only one double bond there, carbon-carbon double bond. And the delta number is the position of the double bond, or double bonds if there are more than one. As you can see, if we start here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that's the position of this double bond. For the omega number, this one is relatively easy. It's how many carbons you have to go through starting from the omega to reach the first double bond. For, so, for example, if this is 1, this is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This is where we get our omega number. So, given that, can you try to give the delta and the omega notations for this linoleic acid? I would be giving it now. For linoleic acid, the delta notation is this. First, the number of carbons is 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I actually know that it's 18, but I'm just counting with you to, to clarify. And then there are obviously two double bonds, and those double bonds are at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So this is 9, 10, 11, 12. So 9 and 12. So that's a complete delta notation for linoleic. And then for the omega notation, this is easy. You count from here then until you reach here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So omega, 6. Now, I'm going to teach you a nifty trick. If you are given the, omega, sorry, the delta notation, you can already get the omega notation. For example, did you notice that we, when you counted the last delta uh, number, which is 12. That's also the double bond that you stop with if you start with the omega and end here. Now, what does that have to do with anything? When you counted 18, you took the entire length here. Then, if you're gonna uh, subtract 12, you're gonna end up with what? So, if I remove this, you're gonna end up with this portion. And isn't this also the portion that you counted in the omega number? What I'm trying to say is, if you subtract the last delta number from the number of carbons, you'd actually get the omega number, right? 18 minus 12 is 6. That's a shortcut that you can do. Kaya, for example, kaya means because in Tagalog, I slip. Um, so, for example, I have alpha-linolenic acid, and this is the delta notation. I can easily give the omega notation, 18 minus 15. So I can say that this is an omega. 3 fatty acid. Or arachidonic acid, 20 minus 14 is an example of an omega 6 fatty acid. There are some fish oils, like for example in tuna or salmon, that uh, mention, we hear mentions of omega 3 fatty acids. 
And they are quite popular because there are a lot of studies suggesting that they have good effects overall on the human body. But uh, we will not discuss the specifics of that in this recording. Now, furthermore, we could actually classify, subclassify unsaturated fatty acids as mono or polyunsaturated. Monounsaturated means as it is, only one double bond. And polyunsaturated means, well, a lot of double bonds. And a lot is two double bonds above. So actually, since this one is three, this is four, uh, linoleic is two. So these are examples of PUFAs. And palmitoleic acid, since it only has one double bond, we can actually call it a MUFA. So um, some further subclassifications. Who knows? You might be asked of this in your biochemistry course. So I'm mentioning it also. And just to cap off our discussion of fatty acids, we need to know not just their properties, but also some of their reactions. I mean, there are so many, so I'll just limit myself to these three because these are the most common ones that you would most likely find in textbooks. Luckily, the first one has been discussed in the introduction, which is saponification. And needless to say, its importance is that this allows us to make our soap. Remember, when we discussed this before, soap has the formula RCOONA. Uh, actually, this could be another metal like calcium, magnesium, or potassium, but we'll, we'll use Na for the meanwhile. And if I'm going to expand this formula, it would look something like this. Now, take note that the length of the carbon chain may vary, of course, depending on the fatty acid that was used. But regardless, the fact that a soap would have this portion means it's lipophilic at one part, meaning it's nonpolar. It's nothing but carbons, right? And the other portion, which has, you know, charges, electronegative and electropositive atoms, make it polar or hydrophilic. And one word that we can use to describe compounds which are both lipophilic and hydrophilic only at different parts of the structure is the word amphiphilic. And if we're going to imagine using our soap for whatever reason, this makes sense. Imagine you are washing the dishes. And you have a plate full of grease. And you know that grease is full of fat, lipid. Of course, if you have grease or lipid on it, you want something that would mix with it. That's why soap has a lipophilic portion, for the soap to mix with the grease. But after doing that, what now? Isn't it that you're going to rinse it with water? And water is polar. So therefore, if you want the grease and the soap to go out with the water, there should be a point of interaction. And this is where the polar portion of the soap comes in. So since there's a polar portion of the soap, this is the thing which would interact with the water such that the grease with the soap and now with the water would be taken away from the plate and down to the drain it will go. So that's uh, why the amphiphilicity of soap makes soap work like soap. Now, after saponification, we have auto-oxidation, which is basically a technical word for the rancidification or the going bad of cooking oils. Uh, usually, this happens when cooking oil has a lot of double bonds in it or a lot of saturate, unsaturated fatty acids with it. Remember, if I have a double bond, that could be used as a reactive site for oxidation and in some cases could lead to cleavage products, which, which actually reduce the efficiency of the cooking oil, meaning you're not really going to cook well with it. Also, not to mention the foul smell that comes along with it. Again, I did mention that auto-oxidation is just another word for the oil going bad. And so, needless to say, it's as if I'm saying here that the double bond actually contributes to a lot to the oil being uh, foul or being rancid faster. That's why some uh, manufacturers of products that need oil perform something called hydrogenation. This is not different from your basic organic chemistry hydrogenation wherein you have a double bond, you add hydrogen in the presence of catalyst, and after adding hydrogen, the double bond becomes a single bond. In the first place, again, isn't it the double bond which makes the oil degrade faster? And so remove the double bond and make it saturated such that it will not degrade as quickly. It's like saying that a lot of manufacturers perform hydrogenation to increase the shelf life or to extend the expiration date of their products. Now, this is going to be a big deal if the manufacturer is a food manufacturer because if they mix hydrogenated cooking oil, or oil with their food products, there's something that may happen at the sideline. Some of the uh, double bonds here will not actually go out, but will rearrange. Remember, the natural double bond in fatty acids is cis. 
And in some cases, some molecules of this do not go in this direction but go here. They only rearrange from a cis configuration to a trans, which gives rise to what we call the trans uh, configuration fatty acids. Or I think a lot of us popularly know them as the trans fats. And they're quite scary because a lot of studies show that trans fats are correlated to cardiovascular risk, you know, heart attacks, and similar disease. And that's why I think the junk foods that contain them, a lot of chips contain them, chocolates, um, people, especially who are, who are health conscious, tell you not to take them too much because, well, partially because of these trans fats.